Morning everyone. I wasn't sure if I was going to do another post over summer or not. I may do some more, I don't know. It's been quite a journey for us here. One of my kids has finally got a diagnosis of ADHD, very firmly in the ADHD zone, and um, just about made the cut for autism level one. And I've known this since they were tiny, and I was disbelieved by the entire education system in England that we came into contact with, by um, sleep professionals, sleep advisors, by psychologists, by half my family. But I could see it. I could see that there were differences from a couple of months old. I could see ADHD traits from 18 months, two years old. And I was told that I shouldn't diagnose my children. I was like, (laughs) It's not about trying to diagnose my children, it's about trying to understand their needs, trying to support them better, trying to research and understand what those differences are and what they mean. And um, for any of you that have been through this process, you'll know exactly how I'm feeling. And for those that are going through the process and not there yet, I'm with you and support yourself because it's tough. There's a lot of grief around, if only I'd been been believed six years ago, my child wouldn't be struggling so much now and that's a really painful thing to come to terms with and you know this there's a lot of sadness you know these these challenges are not just going to go away they are here because they're part of who we are and i say we because i am firmly convinced we're all in the same ballpark spectrum a series of spectrums whatever you want to call it um But I've been thinking about neurodiversity as a whole. And because I've been thinking a lot about the evolutionary purpose of neurodiversity and the traits that exist in so many people. And, you know, some of the research I was reading, you would expect in a class size of 27, 28, for there to be two or three kids with neurodiversity. In my kids' class, there's there were eight. There's now nine out of 27. That's a third. And, you know, people talk about how neurodiversity is on the increase. And I just think it's all backwards. And this makes me really cross. It's all backwards. It's not that neurodiversity is on the increase. It's the environment is becoming less and less sustainable and manageable for the population to live in. Go back to the early 1900s. Classroom sizes were much smaller. Noise was a lot less. You didn't have loud music playing in playgrounds at break times. Not the level that you can get from, um, from like a stereo. You didn't have the constant sound of 27 kids around you, times by two for your year, times by six for the whole school. You didn't have constant sound of electronics and air conditioning and background noise of various electronic and industrial sounds. And so the people of the world who were more sensitive 130, 150 years ago were fine, like it wasn't a problem. The environment suited us all. And as the world gets busier in terms of people, in terms of activities, in terms of industrial and agricultural activities, in terms of electronic activities, in terms of mechanical activities, those of us that are sensitive are finding it more and more overwhelming. And if this trajectory continues, at some point, we're going to hit 50% being diagnosed with neurodiversity, at which point you have to ask yourselves, what are we diagnosing? Who is in the minority here? And why is the environment, why is society, schools, healthcare establishment, public spaces, why are they still set up for the minority of people who are less sensitive to their environment? Why are we not designing public spaces so that they're suitable for everyone? And I know that people, for example, in wheelchairs have been having this argument for a very long time. You know, why are public spaces just not set up for everyone? Why do we have steps with no slopes? I mean, here in Sweden, it's, it's, I think it's better. Um, you know, I'm thinking also about women with pushchairs. Like a lot of the stairs here, when you see concrete steps outside, there's, there's a, a narrow There are narrow channels for the wheels of buggies to go up so you can easily push them upstairs without having to carry them. You know, simple modifications like that for anyone on wheels is considerate of the whole rather than just focusing on the the elite minority who can cope with everything. And it's making me really angry. And it's also making me realise that a massive shift is required. We need smaller classrooms. 
not just for neurodiverse kids, but for everyone. Everyone's quality of learning will be improved in smaller classrooms. There are people, there are so many unemployed people, why not get more teachers? I don't know. I know it's not, I know it's not simple. I know the solution to this isn't simple, but there is a solution. And at some point we need a shift in society where public spaces cater to the needs of the majority rather than the minority. And the more and more, the, the, the direction we're going in is that soon neurodiverse is going to become the majority because as the world gets louder and louder, the number of people that can tolerate the environment is going to become less. So I feel very passionate about this and I see solutions which I'm not in a position to implement. I don't have the power to implement any of these solutions and some of them are really simple. Some of them are as simple as set aside one room in your school for children who need a quiet space that they can go in and out of without requesting this from teachers. And I remember when I was in high school, I often, I'd often play in the playground or hang out with my friends, but sometimes I wanted to go to the library and I'd just sit there and eventually some of my friends would come and join me. And we'd have a little gang of us sitting in there having peace and quiet. It never occurred to me at the time why I needed it. I just knew what I needed and I made sure I got it. But in primary school, it was harder because you don't have that freedom because you need more supervision. But there's got to be a way to do it. There's got to be. And if you did it, if you put these solutions in place, the children that can't cope with the environment that you have generically within your school or generally in your school their behaviour would be calmer and you wouldn't be putting so much resources into managing challenging behaviour. So at some point you need to make a decision. Do I want to prevent these behaviours or do I want to keep managing them? Anyway, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that feel exactly the same way as me about this and that have thought about these things too. I'd love you to get in touch. I'd love you to let me know your thoughts. I think it's really important that we keep pushing on this issue, pushing on this matter that people who are in power, who do have the, the control, the ma who do have the power to change these things, that they start thinking about these things. Anyway, going back to this label for my child, it's incredibly empowering. It's painful because of the grief and the, the lack of belief in me, the lack of trust in me when I saw these things when... My child was smaller. But it's also incredibly validating and empowering because I feel like I can rise up again and be strong. I can trust myself again now. My gut instincts were right. I was right. The thing that I'm uncomfortable with is that this, by definition, means that other people were wrong. And that's something I find harder to accept. In a sense, I knew I was right, but to have kind of evidence that they were wrong that's difficult. I'm not the sort of person that says I told you so, but that's the only line I can use in this particular situation. I wouldn't say that to them directly, but that's, that's, that, that's the truth. That's the reality. I was right. They were wrong. Um, and to have this validation that I can trust myself again, I can trust my instincts. That's huge. That's enormous. It gives me so much strength. It gives me the power to carry on to keep fighting for, for what I know my children need and for what I know I need and for what I know other neurodiverse people need. Right, I'm going to leave it there. It's a beautiful summer's day here. The sun is out again. We've had a couple of days of cloud and rain, the first in months, and it's been wonderful. But it's sunny today. And we're prepare, preparing for our holiday away. So I want to wish you all a good week and keep in touch and enjoy whatever weather you have because whatever you've got there's blessings in it somewhere take care everyone